Section 13 of the Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 1, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. Matilda of Boulogne, Chapter 1, Part 1. Matilda of Boulogne, the last of our Anglo-Norman queens, was a princess of the ancient royal line of English monarchs. Her mother, Mary of Scotland, was the second daughter of Malcolm Canmore and Margaret Atheling, and sister to Matilda the Good, the first queen of Henry Beauclerc. Matilda of Scotland was educated with her elder sister, in the royal monasteries of Wilton and Rumsey, under the stern tutelage of their Aunt Christina, and was doubtless, like the Princess Matilda, compelled to assume the habit of a votaress. Whether the youthful Mary testified the same lively antipathy to the sacred black veil that was exhibited by her elder sister, no gossiping monastic chronicler has recorded. But she certainly forsook the cloister for the court of England on Matilda's auspicious nuptials with Henry I, and exchanged the badge of celibacy for the nuptial ring soon afterwards, when her royal brother-in-law gave her in marriage to Eustace, Count of Boulogne. The father of this nobleman was brother-in-law to Edward the Confessor, having married Gada, the widow Countess of Montez, sister to that monarch. Both himself and his son Eustace had been powerful supporters of the Saxon cause. The enterprising spirit of the Counts of Boulogne, and the contiguity of their dominions to the English shores, had rendered them troublesome neighbors to William the Conqueror and his sons, till the chivalric spirit of crusading attracted their energies to a different channel, and converted these pirates of the narrow seas into heroes of the cross, and liberators of the holy city. Godfrey of Boulogne, the hero of Tassos, Giro Salame Liberata, and his brother Baldwin, who successfully wore the crown of Jerusalem, were the uncles of Matilda, Stephen's queen. Her father, Eustace, Count of Boulogne, was also a distinguished crusader. He must have been a mature husband for Mary of Scotland, since he was the companion in arms of Robert of Normandy, and her uncle Edgar Etheling. Matilda, or as she is sometimes called for brevity, Maud of Boulogne, was the sole offspring of this marriage, and the heiress of this illustrious house. There is every reason to believe Matilda was educated in the Abbey of Bermondsey, to which the Countess of Boulogne, her mother, was a munificent benefactress. The Countess died in this abbey while on a visit to England, in the year 1115, and was buried there. We gather from the Latin verses on her tomb that she was a lady of very noble qualities, and that her death was very painful and unexpected. Young as Matilda was, she was certainly espoused to Stephen de Blois before her mother's decease, for this plain reason, that the charter by which the Countess of Boulogne, in the year 1114, grants to the Klugniac monks of Bermondsey, her manner of kindward stone, is, in the year she died, confirmed by Eustace, her husband, and Stephen, her son-in-law. Stephen, the third son of a vassal peer of France, obtained this great match through the favor of his royal uncle, Henry I. He inherited from the royal Adela, his mother, the splendid talents, fine person, and enterprising spirit of the mighty Norman line of sovereigns. A very tender friendship had subsisted between Adela, Countess of Blois, and her brother, Henry Beauclerc, who at different periods of his life had been under important obligations to her. And when Adela sent her landless boy to seek his fortunes at the court of England, Henry returned the friendly offices which he had received from this faithful sister, by lavishing wealth and honor on her son. Stephen received the spurs of knighthood from his uncle, King Henry, previous to the Battle of Tinchebray, when he took the Count of Mortagain prisoner, and received the investiture of his lands. He was farther rewarded by his royal kinsman with the hand of Matilda, the heiress of Boulogne. When Stephen was but an earl, says William of Malmesbury, he gained the affections of the people, to a degree that can scarcely be imagined, by the affability of his manners, and the wit and pleasantry of his conversation, 
condescending to chat and joke with the persons in the humblest stations, as well as with the nobles, who delighted in his company, and attached themselves to his cause from personal regard. Stephen was Count of Boulogne in Matilda's right, when, as Count of Mortagne, he swore fealty in 1126 to the Empress Matilda, as heiress to the Norman dominions of Henry I. The London residence of Stephen and Matilda was Tower Royal, a palace built by King Henry, and presented by him to his favored nephew, on the occasion of his marrying the niece of his Queen Matilda Atheling. The spot to which this regal-sounding name is still appended, is a close lane between Cheapside and Walting Street. Tower Royal was a fortress of prodigious strength, for more than once, when the Tower of London itself fell into the hands of the rebels, this embattled palace of Stephen remained in security. It is a remarkable fact that Stephen had embarked on board the Blanche Neff with his royal cousin, William the Etheling, and the rest of her fated crew. But with two knights of his train, and a few others who prudently followed his example, he left the vessel with the remark that she was too much crowded with foolish, headstrong young people. After the death of Prince William, Stephen's influence with his royal uncle became unbounded, and he was his constant companion in all his voyages to Normandy. There are evidences of conjugal infidelity on the part of this gay and gallant young prince, about this period, proving that Matilda's cup of happiness was not without some alloy of bitterness. How far her peace was affected by the scandalous reports of the passion, which her haughty cousin the Empress Matilda, the acknowledged heiress of England and Normandy, was said to cherish for her aspiring husband, we cannot presume to say. But there was an angel-like spirit in this princess, which supported her under every trial, and rendered her a beautiful example to every royal female in the married state. Two children, a son and a daughter, were born to the young Earl and Countess of Boulogne during King Henry's reign. The boy was named Baldwin, after Matilda's uncle, the King of Jerusalem, a Saxon name withal, and therefore likely to sound pleasantly to the ears of the English, who, no doubt, looked with complacency on the infant heir of Boulogne, as the son of a princess of the royal Atheling blood, born among them, and educated by his amiable mother to venerate their ancient laws, and to speak their language. Prince Baldwin, however, died in early childhood, and was interred in the priory of the Holy Trinity, without Aldgate, founded by his royal aunt, Matilda of Scotland. The second child of Stephen and Matilda, a daughter named Maud, born also in the reign of Henry I, died young, and was buried in the same church. Some historians aver that Maud survived long enough to be espoused to the Earl of Milan. So dear was the memory of these, her buried hopes, to the heart of Matilda, that after she became the Queen of England, and her loss was supplied by the birth of another son and daughter, she continued to lament for them, and the church and the hospital of St. Catherine by the Tower were founded and endowed by her that prayers might be perpetually said by the pious sisterhood for the repose of the souls of her first-born children. In the latter days of King Henry, when Stephen was engaged in stealing the hearts of the men of England, after the fashion of Absalom, the mild virtues of his amiable consort recalled to their remembrance her royal aunt and namesake, Henry's first queen, and inspired them with a trembling hope, of seeing her place filled eventually by a princess so much more resembling her than the haughty wife of Geoffrey of Anjou. The Norman woman looked upon her mother's people with scorn, and from her they had nothing to expect but the iron yoke which her grandfather, the conqueror, had laid upon their necks, with, perhaps, an aggravation of their miseries. But Stephen, the husband of her gentle cousin, the English-hearted Matilda, had whispered in their ears of the confirmation of the great charter of their liberties, which Henry of Normandy had granted when he became the husband of the descendant of their ancient kings, and broken when her influence was destroyed by death and a foreign marriage. King Henry's daughter, the Empress Matilda, was the wife of a foreign prince residing on the continent. Stephen and his amiable princess were living in London, and daily endearing themselves to the people, by the most popular and affable behavior. The public mind was certainly predisposed in favor of Stephen's designs, when the sudden death of King Henry in Normandy left the right of succession for the first time to a female heir. 
Piers of Langtoft thus describes the perplexity of the nation respecting the choice of the sovereign. On Byre lay King Henry, on Byre beyond the sea, and no man might rightly know who his heir should be. Stephen, following the example of the deceased monarch's conduct at the time of his brother Rufus's death, left his royal uncle and benefactor's obsequies to the care of Robert, Earl of Gloucester, and the other peers who were witnesses to his last words, and embarking at Whitsand, a small port in Matilda's dominions, in a light vessel, on a wintry sea, he landed at Dover, in the midst of such a storm of thunder and lightning, that according to William of Malmesbury, every one imagined the world was coming to an end. As soon as he arrived in London, he convened an assembly of the Anglo-Norman barons before whom his confederate and friend, Hugh Bigod, the steward of King Henry's household, swore on the holy evangelist, that the deceased sovereign had disinherited the Empress Matilda on his deathbed, and adopted his most dear nephew, Stephen, for his heir. On this bold affirmation, the Archbishop of Canterbury absolved the peers of the oaths of fealty they had twice sworn to the daughter of the late sovereign, and declared that those oaths were null and void, and contrary, moreover, to the laws and customs of the English, who had never permitted a woman to reign over them. This was a futile argument, as no female had ever stood in that important position, with regard to the succession to the crown of England, in which the Empress Matilda was now placed. Therefore no precedent had occurred for the establishment of a saliquy law in England. Stephen was crowned on the 26th of December, his name day, the Feast of St. Stephen. He swore to establish the righteous laws of Edward the Confessor, for the general happiness of all classes of his subjects. The English regarded Stephen's union with a princess of their race, as the best pledge of the sincerity of his professions, in regard to the amelioration of their condition. These hopes were, of course, increased by the birth of Prince Eustace, whom Matilda brought into the world very soon after her husband's ascension to the throne of England. It was, perhaps, this auspicious event that prevented Matilda from being associated in the coronation of her lord on St. Stephen's Day in Westminster Abbey. Her own coronation, according to Gervais, took place March 22, 1136, being Easter Sunday, not quite three months afterwards. Stephen was better enabled to support the expenses of a splendid ceremonial in honor of his beloved queen, having, immediately after his own hasty inauguration, posted to Winchester and made himself master of the treasury of his deceased uncle, King Henry, which contains, says Malmesbury, 100,000 pounds, besides stores of plate and jewels. The Empress Matilda was in Anjou at the time of her father's sudden demise. She was entirely occupied by the grievous sickness of her husband, who was supposed to be on his deathbed. After the convalescence of her lord, as none of her partisans in England made the slightest movement in her favor, she remained quiescent for a season, well knowing that the excessive popularity of a new monarch is seldom of long continuance in England. Stephen had begun well by abolishing Dangelt, and leaving the game in the woods, forests, and uncultivated wastes, common to all his subjects. But after a while he repented of his liberal policy, and called courts of inquiry to make men give account of the damage and loss he had sustained in his fallow deer and other wild game. He likewise enforced the offensive system of the other Norman monarchs for their preservation. Next he obtained the enmity of the clergy, by seizing the revenues of the See of Canterbury, and lastly, to the great alarm and detriment of the peacefully disposed, he imprudently permitted his nobles to build or fortify upwards of a thousand of those strongholds of wrong and robbery, called castles, which rendered their owners in a great measure independent of the crown. Baldwin de Redvere's, Earl of Devonshire, was the first to give Stephen a practical proof of his want of foresight in this matter, by telling him, on some slight cause of offense, that he was not king of right, and he would obey him no longer. Stephen proceeded in person to chastise him. In the meantime, David, king of Scotland, invaded the northern counties, under the pretense of revenging the wrong that had been done to his niece, the Empress Matilda, by Stephen's usurpation and perjury. 
Matilda of Boulogne, Stephen's consort, stood in the same degree of relationship to the King of Scotland, as the Empress Matilda, since her mother, Mary of Scotland, was his sister, no less than Matilda, the Queen of Henry I. Stephen concluded a hasty peace with the Welsh princes, and advanced to repel the invasion of King David, but when the hostile armies met near Carlisle, he succeeded in adjusting all differences by means of an amicable treaty, perhaps through the entreaties or mediation of his queen. Easter was kept at Westminster this year, 1137, by Stephen and Matilda, with greater splendor than had ever been seen in the court of Henry Beauclerc, to celebrate the happy termination of the storm that had so lately darkened the political horizon. But the rejoicings of the queen were fearfully interrupted by the alarming illness which suddenly attacked the king, in the midst of the festivities for his safe return from the Welsh and northern expeditions. This illness, the effect no doubt of the preternatural exertions of both mental and corporeal powers, which Stephen had compelled himself to use, during the recent momentous crisis of his fortunes, was a sort of stupor or lethargy so nearly resembling death, that it was reported in Normandy that he had breathed his last, on which the party of the Empress began to take active measures, both on the continent and in England, for the recognition of her rights. The Count of Anjou entered Normandy at the head of an army, to assert the claims of his wife and son, which were, however, disputed by Stephen's elder brother, Theobald Count of Blois, not in behalf of Stephen, but himself, and the Earl of Gloucester openly declared himself in favor of his sister the Empress, and delivered the keys of Falaise to her husband, Geoffrey of Anjou. When Stephen recovered from his death-like sickness, he found everything in confusion, the attention of his faithful queen, Matilda, having doubtless been absorbed in anxious watchings by his sickbed, during the protracted period of his strange and alarming malady. She was now left to take care of his interests in England as best she might, for Stephen, rousing himself from the pause of exhausted nature, hastened to the continent with his infant heir, Eustace, to whom Queen Matilda had resigned the earldom of Boulogne, her own fair inheritance. Stephen, by the strong eloquence of an immense bribe, prevailed on Louis the Seventh of France, as suzerain of Normandy, to invest the unconscious babe with the duchy, and to receive his liege homage for the same. Meantime, some portentous events occurred during Matilda's government. Sudden and mysterious conflagrations then, as now, indicated the sullen discontent of the very lower order of the English people. On the 3rd of June, 1137, Rochester Cathedral was destroyed by fire. The following day, the whole city of York, with its cathedral and thirty churches, was burnt to the ground. Soon after, the city of Bath shared the same fate. Then conspiracies began to be formed in the favor of the Empress Matilda, in various parts of England, and lastly, her uncle, David, King of Scotland, once more entered Northumberland, with banners displayed, in support of his supplanted kinswoman's superior title to the crown. Queen Matilda, with courage and energy suited to this alarming crisis, went in person and besieged the insurgents, who had seized Dover Castle, and she sent orders to the men of Boulogne, her loyal subjects, to attack the rebels by sea. The Boulogne obeyed the commands of their beloved princess with alacrity, and to such good purpose, by covering the channel with their light-armed vessels, that the besieged, not being able to receive the slightest succor by sea, were forced to submit to the queen. At this juncture Stephen arrived, and succeeded in chastising the leaders of the revolt, and drove the Scottish king over his own border. Nevertheless, the Empress Matilda's party, in the year 1138, began to assume a formidable aspect. Every day brought tidings to the court of Stephen of some fresh revolt. William of Malmesbury relates that when Stephen was informed of these desertions, he passionately exclaimed, Why did they make me king if they forsake me thus? By the birth of God, I will never be called an abdicated king. The invasion of Queen Matilda's uncle, David of Scotland, for the third time increased the distraction of her royal husband's affairs, especially as Stephen was too much occupied with the internal troubles of his kingdom to be able to proceed, in person, against him. David and his army were, however, defeated with immense slaughter 
by the warlike Thurston, Archbishop of York, at Cutton Moor. The particulars of this engagement, called the Battle of the Standard, where the church militant performed such notable service for the crown, belong to general history, and are besides too well known to require repetition in the biography of Stephen's queen. Matilda was mainly instrumental in negotiating the peace which was concluded this year between her uncle and her lord. Prince Henry, the heir of Scotland, having at the same time renewed his homage to Stephen for the earldom of Huntingdon, was invited by the king to his court. The attention with which the young prince was treated by the king and queen was viewed with invidious eyes by their ill-mannered courtiers, and Ranulf, Earl of Chester, took such great offense at the royal stranger being seated above him at dinner, that he made it an excuse for joining the revolted barons, and persuaded a knot of equally uncivilized nobles to follow his example on the same pretense. The Empress Matilda, taking advantage of the fierce contention between Stephen and the hierarchy of England, made her tardy appearance, in pursuance of her claims to the crown, in the autumn of 1140. Like her uncle, Robert the Unready, the Empress allowed the critical moment to slip, when, by prompt and energetic measures, she might have gained the prize for which she contended. But she did not arrive till Stephen had made himself master of the castles, and what was of more importance to him, the great wealth of his three refractory prelates, the Bishop of Salisbury, Eli, and Lincoln. When the Empress was shut up within the walls of Arundel Castle, Stephen might, by one bold stroke, have made her his prisoner, but he was prevailed upon to respect the ties of consanguinity, and the high rank of the widow, and of the daughter of his benefactor, King Henry. It is possible, too, that recollections of a tenderer nature, with regard to his cousin the Empress, might deter him from imperiling her person, by pushing the siege. According to some of the chroniclers, the Empress sent, with Queen Adelicia's request, that she might be permitted to retire to Bristol, a guileful letter or message to Stephen, which induced him to promise, on his word of honor, that he would grant her safe conduct to that city. Though the Empress knew that Stephen had violated the most solemn oaths, which he had taken in regard to her succession to the crown, she relied upon his honor, and put herself under his protection, and was safely conducted to the castle of Bristol. King Stephen gave to his brother, Henry of Blois, Bishop of Winchester, and to Walleran, Earl of Malent, the charge of conducting the Empress to Bristol Castle. This bright trait of chivalry contrasts beautifully with the selfishness and perfidy too prevalent at that era. It was during this journey, in all probability, that Henry de Blois arranged his plans with the Empress Matilda, for making her mistress of the royal city of Winchester, which was entirely under his influence. While the Earl of Gloucester, on behalf of his sister the Empress, was contesting with King Stephen the realm of England at the sword's point, Queen Matilda proceeded to France, with her son Eustace, to endeavor to strengthen her husband's cause, by the aid of her foreign connections, and while at the court of France, successfully exerted her diplomatic powers, in negotiating a marriage between the Princess Constance, sister of Louis the Seventh, and Prince Eustace, then about four years old. The Queen presided at this infant marriage, which was celebrated with great splendor. Instead of receiving a dowry with a princess, Queen Matilda paid a large sum to purchase her son the bride. Louis the Seventh, in return solemnly invested his young brother-in-law with the Duchy of Normandy, and lent his powerful aid to maintain him there as the nominal sovereign, under the direction of the queen his mother. This alliance, which took place in the year 1140, greatly raised the hopes of Stephen's party, but the bands of foreign mercenaries, which his queen Matilda sent over from Boulogne and the ports of Normandy to his succor, had an injurious effect on his cause, and were beheld with jealous alarm by the people of the land whose miseries were in no slight degree aggravated, says the chronicler Gervais, by the arrival of these hunger-starved wolves, who completed the destruction of the land's felicity. It was during the absence of Queen Matilda and her son, Prince Eustace, that the battle, so disastrous to her husband's cause, was fought, beneath the walls of Lincoln, on Candlemas Day, 1141. Stephen had shut up a great many of the Empress Matilda's partisans and their families in the city of Lincoln, which he had been for some time besieging. 
the earl of gloucester's youngest daughter lately married to her cousin renolf earl of chester was among the besieged and so determined were the two earls her father and her husband for her deliverance that they encouraged their followers to swim or ford the deep cold waters of the river trent behind which stephen and his army were encamped and fiercely attacked him in their dripping garments and all for the relief of the fair ladies who were trembling within the walls of lincoln and beginning to suffer from lack of provisions these were the days of chivalry be it remembered speed gives us a descriptive catalogue of some of the leading characters among our valiant king stephen's knights sans payer which if space were allowed us we would abstract from the animated harangue with which the earl of gloucester endeavoured to warm his shivering followers into a virtuous blaze of indignation after they had emerged from their cold bath his satirical eloquence was received by the partisans of the empress with a tremendous shout of applause and stephen not to be behind-handed with his foes in bandying personal abuse as a prelude to a fight as his powers of articulation happened to be defective deputed one baldwin fitzgilbert a knight who was blessed with a stentorian voice to thunder forth his recrimination on the earl of gloucester and his host in the ears of both armies fitzgilbert in his speech laid scornful stress on the illegitimacy of the empress's champion whom he designated robert the base-born general the battle for which both parties had prepared themselves with such sharp encounter of keen words was to use the expression of contemporary chroniclers a very sore one but it seems as if stephen had fought better than his followers that day a very strange sight it was says matthew paris there to behold king stephen left almost alone in the field yet no man daring to approach him while grinding his teeth and foaming like a furious wild boar he drove back with his battle-axe the assailing squadrons slaying the foremost of them to the eternal renown of his courage if but a hundred like himself had been with him a whole army had never been able to capture his person yet single-handed as he was he held out till first his battle-axe break and afterwards his sword shivered in his grasp with the force of his own resistless blows though he was borne backward to his knees by a great stone which by some ignoble person was flung at him a stout knight william of kames then seized him by the helmet and holding the point of his sword to his throat called upon him to surrender even in this extremity stephen refused to give up the fragment of his sword to any one but the earl of gloucester his valiant kinsman who coming up bade his infuriated troops refrain from any further violence and conducted his royal captive to the empress matilda at gloucester the earl of gloucester it is said treated stephen with some degree of courtesy but the empress matilda whose hatred appears to have emanated from a deeper root of bitterness than mere rivalry of power loaded him with indignities and ordered him into the most rigorous confinement in bristol castle according to general historians she caused him to be heavily ironed and used the royal captive as ignominiously as if he had been the lowest felon but william of malmesbury says this was not till after stephen had attempted to make his escape or it was reported that he had been seen several times beyond the bounds prescribed for air and exercise the empress matilda made her public and triumphant entry into the city of winchester february seventh where she was received with great state by stephen's equally haughty brother henry de blois bishop of winchester and cardinal legate he appeared at the head of all the clergy and monks of the diocese and even the nuns of winchester a thing before unheard of walked unveiled in procession to receive and welcome the rightful heiress of the realm the daughter of the great and learned henry fitz conqueror and of matilda the descendant of the etheling the english had also the satisfaction of seeing the male representative of their ancient monarchs on that occasion within the walls of winchester for david of scotland the son of margaret of etheling was present to do honor to his niece the victorious rival of stephen's crown henry de blois resigned the regal ornaments and the paltry residue of her father's treasure into the hands of the empress the next day he received her with great pomp in his cathedral church where he excommunicated all the adherents of his unfortunate brother 
and promised absolution to all who should abandon his cause and join the empress. In this melancholy position did Queen Matilda find her husband's cause, when she returned from her successful negotiation, of the marriage between the French king's sister, and her son the young Count of Boulogne, whom she had left, for the present, established as Duke of Normandy. The peers and clergy had alike abandoned the luckless Stephen in his adversity, and the Archbishop of Canterbury, being a man of tender conscience, had actually visited Stephen in prison, to request his permission to transfer his oath of allegiance to his victorious rival, the Empress Matilda. In this predicament, the faithful consort of the fallen monarch applied herself to the citizens of London, with whom she had ever maintained a great share of popularity. They knew her virtues, for she had lived among them, and her tender affection for her royal spouse in his adversity, was well pleasing to those who had witnessed the domestic happiness of the princely pair, while they lived in Tower Royal, as Count and Countess of Boulogne. And the remembrance of Stephen's free and pleasant conduct, an affable association with all sorts and conditions of men, before he wore the thorny diadem of a doubtful title to the sovereignty of England, disposed the magistracy of London to render every assistance in their power to their unfortunate king. So powerfully, indeed, had the personal influence of Queen Matilda operated in that quarter, that when the magistrates of London were summoned to send their deputies to a synod at Winchester, held by Henry de Blois, which had predetermined the election of the Empress Matilda to the throne, they instructed them to demand the liberation of the king in the name of the barons and citizens of London, as a preliminary to entering into any discussion with the partisans of his enemy. Henry de Blois replied, that it did not become the Londoners to side with the adherents of Stephen, whose object was to embroil the kingdom in fresh troubles. Queen Matilda, finding that the trusty citizens of London were baffled by the priestly subtlety of her husband's brother, Henry de Blois, took the decided, but at that time unprecedented step, of writing, in her own name, an eloquent letter to the synod, earnestly entreating those in whose hands the government of England was vested, to restore the king, her husband, to liberty. This letter the queen's faithful chaplain, Christian, delivered in full synod to the legate Henry de Blois. The prelate, after he had perused the touching appeal of his royal sister-in-law, refused to communicate its purport to the assembly, on which Christian boldly took the queen's letter out of his hand, and read it aloud to the astonished conclave, courageously disregarding the anger and opposition of the legate, who was at that time virtually the sovereign of the realm. Henry de Blois effectually prevented any good effect resulting from the persuasive address of the high-minded consort of his unfortunate brother, by dissolving the synod and declaring that the Empress Matilda was lawfully elected as the domina or sovereign lady of England. The following are the words of the formula in which the declaration was delivered. Having first, as is fit, invoked the aid of Almighty God, we elect as Lady of England and Normandy, the daughter of the glorious, the rich, the good, the peaceful King Henry, and to her we promise fealty and support. No word is here of the good old laws, the laws of Alfred and St. Edward, or of the great charter which Henry I agreed to observe. The Empress was the leader of the Norman party, and the head of the Norman feudality, which, in many instances, was incompatible with the Saxon constitution. Arrogant and disdainful as her imperial education had rendered her, she bore those new honors with anything but meekness. She refused to listen to the counsel of her friends, and treated those of her adversaries whom misfortune drove to seek her clemency, with insolence and cruelty, stripping them of their possessions, and rendering them perfectly desperate. The friends who had contributed to her elevation frequently met with a harsh refusal when they asked favors, and, says an old historian, when they bowed themselves down before her, she did not rise in return. Meantime, the sorrowful Queen Matilda was unremitting in her exertions for the liberation of her unfortunate lord, who was at this time heavily ironed and ignominiously treated by order of the Empress. Not only England, but Normandy, was now lost to the captive monarch her husband, and their young heir, Prince Eustace. For Geoffrey of Anjou, as soon as he had received intelligence of the decisive battle of Lincoln, 
persuaded the Norman baronage to withdraw their allegiance from their recently invested duke, and to transfer it to his wife the empress, and her son Henry, certainly the rightful heirs of William the Conqueror. The loss of regal state and sovereign power was, however, regarded by the Queen of Stephen as a matter of little moment. In the season of adversity, it was not only the king, but the man, the husband of her youth, and the father of her children, to whom the tender-hearted Matilda of Boulogne clung, with a devotion not often to be met with in the personal history of royalty. It was for his sake that she condescended to humble herself, by addressing the lowly entreaties of her haughty cousin, the Empress Matilda, to her, who, if the report of some contemporary chroniclers is to be credited, had betrayed her husband into a breach of his marriage vow. The insulting scorn, with which the Empress rejected every petition, which the wedded wife of Stephen presented to her, in behalf of her fallen foe, looks like the vindictive spirit of a jealous woman, especially when we reflect, that not only the virtues of Matilda of Boulogne, but the closeness of her consanguinity to herself, required her to be treated with some degree of consideration and respect. End of section 13